<clears throat> My brethren, I'm delighted to be here and good to see, good to see each one of you. In the uh, biography, you noticed uh, all the colleges I attended have changed names. I didn't change those names. <laughs> but you might look at that and say that I'm a has-been, too. It's a great honor to be here. I appreciate so very much the hospitality of you, my brethren, of the elders who extend the invitation. I was thankful when I got the email from David wanting to know if I'd speak on this subject. Uh, I'm the president of the Real Foot Amateur Radio Club, and there's a convention in Dalton, Georgia yesterday that I'm supposed to have attended. But I decided to be here. And this will be the last year of my reign, which I came through plenty, but anyway, <laughs> and may have to attend it next year. But, and I want to thank uh, Gene and Joy Litke. They turned over one end of the house to me. And Joy is indeed Gene's Joy. And Gene is Joy's Joy. And I was happy with both of them. And she put it rent me. I had breakfast at home. I told her I ate cereal. And she went every morning to try to fix something special and pick up after me. <laughs> As disappointed that I'd ask her to do more. And Gene apologized. He said, I'm sorry, I'm a slow starter. Well, my, if that had been any uh, nicer, I couldn't have stood it. <laughs> so thanks, Gene and Joy, from the bottom of my heart. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the life, John 14, 6. There are a lot of things to consider in that, and some I'll not even touch. To begin with, he is the author of life itself, physical, as well as spiritual. John, in his writings, in John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as well as, well as Revelation, uses the word beginning several times. That has nothing to do with in the beginning, which he also uses. So when we study, we need to be careful and look at the in the beginning. It's talking about when everything was created both in heaven and on earth. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, in the beginning God, uh, I'm sorry, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In Genesis 1 verse 26 we read a new phrase let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let him man have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the face of the earth and that and beast was accomplished the sixth day let us when man had fell through transgression in sin, let us, and on and on this goes. It's interesting to me, and always has been, that this word which was, which was in the beginning and was God, was light. And light and darkness are often contrasted in the scriptures. The struggle for mankind over the years has been the matter of light and darkness. For instance, when God had made man and then woman from his side, placed them in the beautiful Garden of Eden, the paradise of God, prohibited not to eat of the tree of the, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
And Genesis 3 begins with a dark period. In verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And finally told Eve, or the woman, what God told you is not right. You shall not surely die. She saw lust eye. She tasted lust of the flesh. And you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil, the pride of life. One of my associates over the years was prone to say, and I sort of picked up that saying after him, when God made everything through his son Jesus Christ, on the seventh day, he sat down and rested. When man sinned, God had to get up and go to work. He started running toward the day of Pentecost. He promised his son in Genesis 3 verse 15, through the seed of woman. Now stay with me here. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree of the midst of the garden, they died then and there spiritually. They lived several hundred years following. Adam named her Eve in Genesis 3 verse 20. And why the Septuagint version did not, or the people translators did not follow the Septuagint version, I don't know. Eve's name means life. Adam said her name is Eve because she's the mother of all living her name means life. From the one that brought spiritual death into this world, through Seth that was born, would bring spiritual life through Christ. That indeed is an amazing thing. The devil tried to envelop the light that was there and could not. He tried during or before the flood. All the thoughts and imagination of man heart on evil continually. He repented God had made man and said, I'll destroy him. But Noah found favor or grace in the sight of the Lord. God said, I'm not going to let that happen. The devil's not going to defeat me. And there's the flood. Man starting over after the flood. Abraham, through thy seed, all nations of the earth be blessed. There's that seed of woman that would bring the word into the world. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 verse 14. The word was made. I think the American Sanders says. But anyway, the devil did all he could to envelop the light that God was shedding abroad upon mankind. There were dark periods. Think about the time that Joseph is sold by his brothers to some Ishmaelite traders who traded him off in Egypt, representing the sunlight of God's love. Not one stroke against Joseph was ever written. Against Joseph. Ever written. He's not directly in the seed line. But here's the importance. The dream, seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Fat ears, lean ears, fat cows, lean cows. The devil doing everything he could do to put out the light of God's love. Joseph represented the sunlight of God's love. Finally, his son, his, his brothers, and his father, Jacob, and his sons are issued into Egypt. And one of those sons would be Judah, from which the man-child in Bethlehem of Judea would be born, thousands of years later. The devil tried to put out the light. 
but Christ is the light of the world. John 8. We're to be as a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. There arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. The book of Exodus starts. Moses, a representative of God selected by God to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage after 430 years. The devil still is not one. And on and on we go. We come to time in 1 Samuel 8, and I've skipped a whole lot of things I'd like to talk about. 1 Samuel 8, they said we want a king so we can be like the other nations. Instead of influencing the other nations as, as they should have, they turned into being what the other nations were. It looks like the devil is winning and there'll be no light. The purpose of Satan is to envelop that light, to put that light out. So that man does not have a choice in the scheme of redemption that God announced, he purposed in Genesis 3, he promised in Genesis 12, and on down through time. Samuel started the school of the prophets. After the death of David, more about David a little later. There was one by the name of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin, a split in the kingdom. Ten tribes, northern. Two tribes, southern. Judah and Benjamin, known simply as Judah. Every king of the northern kingdom was bad. Not one good one of the bunch. They go into captivity roughly 150 years before Judah. Judah should have learned the lesson. Instead, we can prove successfully that Judah became worse than the children of Israel from the ten for the ten tribes. The devil is winning. The devil wants to put out that light. But the devil could not win. The darkness could not envelop the light. The promise of God would be fulfilled. Born in Bethlehem of Judea, his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. In the beginning was the word. Will God fail? Will God do what he says he will do? Will he keep all of his promises? Peter would argue that he will. And all of this audience would argue that he will. In John chapter 1 and verse number 10. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. I'm going back now to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. God is plural. Elohim. Within this Godhead, there's the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Verse 2 and 3. And then Jesus in the making. Verse 26. And now notice. God said, let there be light and there was light. There's the Son of God under His Father creating light and darkness. The six days of creation miraculously said and done. And from that day until this date in 2018 the earth still propagates from the seed like unto that which is planted or sowed. We still have light and darkness. We, have, we still have a daytime and a nighttime. We still have seasons. None of them miraculous now. But in the beginning, every one of them miraculous. So that a mighty water oak did not come from what it appears, was gone, it was born full grown made full grown, bearing after its kind, dropping acorns and, everything, and whatever else it produces. Each seed bearing after its kind. 
There's our Lord in the beginning. I want to turn to 1 John chapter 1. Well, the speaker mentioned this uh, in a lesson that might have been David, and I think it was, in uh, the lesson he presented for Brother Hightower. In 1 John chapter 1, notice again. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Now, notice we have some senses mentioned here. Which we've heard. You can hear almost anything. He said, which we have seen with our eyes. Vision can be averted. I was coming in on this ridiculous highway out here. <laughs> Too much for a country boy. And there were two Corvettes, a black one and a red one. And I was going 65. And they came in, whoom! I promise you, my eyes were diverted. I said, what am I doing here? <laughs> we can hear almost anything. Our eyes can be diverted. He said, we've seen with our eyes. We looked upon. Here's a testimony of witnesses. Have you ever been asked by an attorney or maybe a judge, uh, someone asked you to come to a trial and to testify? And want to know, what did you see? Oh, I didn't see anything. I heard so and so. Well, you won't do. We want an eyewitness. Not only be good for you to hear something, we want you to make sure you saw that. We want you to testify to what you saw. He said, we heard. Our eyes have seen, we looked upon him. And our hands have handled of the word of life. Our hands handle the word of life. And here are the twelve. And whose breast was it? Who was the great friend of Jesus Christ among the twelve? Well, I'd say all of them, but his special friend was John, was it not? I know this is inspired of God, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, but I also know, and you also know, that John would know that this was the Christ, the Son, the living God. My eyes saw that. Our hands have handled for about three and a half years toiling and laboring and being with the Lord and Him feeding them and them feeding Him and washing their feet. All oh, they knew of the word of life. Remember, darkness is trying to put out the light. For the life was manifested, it is made known. And we have seen it and bear witness. And shown to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Here I think of Philip in uh, John 14, 8 and 9. Show us the Father. Well, Philip, have I been with you this long and you don't know? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And John is writing these things that we may have fellowship. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. He said, and this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Where is eternal life? Is it in Christ or out? All spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus, Paul wrote in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Eternal life is in his Son. While Jesus 2 verse 7, God breathed the man's dross with the breath of life, and he became a living soul. The word soul there has to do with uh, more of the air we breathe. I'd like to express it that way. Maybe we take for granted. You realize that every living thing about us breathes. 
The fish of the sea have a way to breathe. The birds of the air have a way to breathe. They, they breathe. We breathe the same air. We had a nice dog at Jean and Joy's. I think she liked me. She didn't bite me. That dog breathed the same breath, the same air that I breathe. That dog can be trained. That dog has instinct, doesn't have a soul. We have a soul that is different from the breath that we breathe. That soul came from our Savior Jesus Christ, from God the Father. Just as the breath of physical life came through the breath of life that was breathed in the man's nostrils. Almost the first statement out of my mouth was that our Savior issued in physical life as well as eternal life. I continue. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. How do you have the Son? Brother Douglas in the previous hour extended the Lord's invitation showed us how to have life in the Son. Through repentance and obeying the gospel to be saved from self and from sin. To put on Christ, bed with him, in baptism, raised up to walk in the newness of life. Romans 6, verse 4. Putting on the Son. Embracing His precious name. And Peter said it was given an example that you should follow in steps. Following in the footsteps of Jesus. Imitating Him as best we possibly can. He that saith, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The person who says, I have a son of God, or I believe in all my heart under shade tree over yonder somewhere or another. The Lord appeared to me and told me something. No, you need to repent. You need to say the, printer's, the, the sinner's prayer. Oh, I, I have the son. Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you done what the Bible says to do in order to be saved? Well, uh, no, I, I, I really had. Well, my friend, you don't have the son. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. You not only have a spiritual life here, you have a life in torment. After a while. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 1, another aspect of Christ. Paul writes to Timothy, as he has com been commanded, he said, and he mentions this little four-letter word, hope, H-O-P-E. In Colossians 1, verse 27, Paul mentions that hope. I had a dear first cousin, Martha Sue Taylor, and she married a Henley. Had a new baby. Coming down south to visit with us, all the family, from Nancy, Michigan. The child suddenly became ill. They stopped in Bowling Green, Kentucky at a hospital. And the emergency room, the physicians did all they could do to take care of the child. And we came out, Martha, Sue, and Chuck was called to the physician. And the door where they entered, and where people that's waiting for the hearse, that was a different door. And Martha Sue said, she said, is there hope? And he pointed down the hall. There's no hope. Think about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Without God and without hope in this world, hopeless and hapless, that's what is the man, the woman, that doesn't have the Lord. There is no hope. And I'd be an ingrate 
If I said for those outside of Christ, oh, you have great hope, not in your present condition. There is no hope whatsoever. Think of torment for just a moment. Think about never being able to shed, to get rid of, to get it loose from. All the sins of our life can't run from them, can't pray, live with them eternally. That's what people who have no hope will do. I want to look further at uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. Speaking of that life. When Christ who is our life shall appear. Then shall we also appear with him in glory. Christ who is our life shall appear. In Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17, note he says, speaking of Christ who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. What an august Savior created by him and for him. And he is our life. He is before all things and in him does all things consist. It will be a sad day. The saddest we've ever known when we stand in judgment and our name is called and we're not prepared to meet our Savior. The one who gave us physical life and gave us the opportunity to those who loved us enough to teach and to preach the gospel of our Lord that would give us eternal life or spiritual life if we would obey his will. I am the life, he said. I am the life. In John 14, verse 26, <clears throat> Jesus promised a peace. Some of the brothers addressed that good this week or during this lectureship, and I want to address it once more <clears throat> in this lesson. But the comfort which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father said in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The word comforter, in my judgment, is not the best translation. It is used here as well as John 15, 26. It's the same word that's used here. See if you can pick out this word. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our, our sins. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And hereby do we know that we know him if he keep his commandments. If we say that we know him and keep not his commandments, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. Now what is the word for comforter? It's the word advocate. If you brethren look at that word, you'll see it's the very same. That's 1426 and 1526 of John. What does an advocate do? Oh, the beautiful representation. An advocate is one who stands beside another. Picture Christ now standing beside God, and he is our mediator, as Paul tells Timothy. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, and here he stands beside God the Father in our behalf, pleading our cause. He is our advocate. In a different way, he was an advocate for the apostles. Everything I've ever said, he said, you'll be able to remember it. This advocate is going to do that. Going to do that. They needed a comforter because their trouble, chapter 14. They needed someone to comfort them. 
But this advocate would do the work. Look at that word as you have time. See if you draw the same conclusion. Comforter's not wrong. I do not know that he expresses as well as an advocate, at least in my mind's eye. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The other aspect that I'd like to draw attention to was that Jesus was a person of peace. He told the apostles, he said, My peace I give unto you. A peace that the world cannot have. Someone in one of the lessons previous mentioned something that peace and what is it? In Ezekiel chapter 34, beginning in verse number 23, God says, I will set up one shepherd. The shepherd was the king, by the way. A priest, a prophet was never called a shepherd. He said, I'll set up one shepherd over them and shall feed them even my servant David. He shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. Here's Christ is the shepherd or someone had the subject of the good shepherd. My servant David. Verse 24, and I the Lord will be their God and my servant David a prince among them. I the Lord have spoken it. My friends, when Ezekiel wrote this, David had been, David had been dead 400 years. That's not something that is yet to happen out there in the future somewhere. This happened at one time in the life of man and that was on the day of Pentecost. Christ became the shepherd of our soul and that from the cross. To reign on the throne of his father David who was of the seed of Seth who was the seed of Eve, the mother of life. Note, he said, I will make with them a covenant of peace. When man sinned, God in his righteous indignation, his righteous anger, so disappointed what man had done that he created, would not honor him and cherish him, had to be appeased. The law issued in a day of atonement where a male ram was used every day of atonement, if my research is correct. Where they remembered their sins. I've never liked the term roll their sins far, though that might express the notion. Every year they remembered their sins, forwarded, forwarded, forwarded. They remembered their sins, remembered their sins, remembered their sins. And God's saying, there's coming a time when my son will reign on a throne and your sins of iniquity I will not remember anymore. I'll throw them behind my back. Christ, Jesus, the Son of the Almighty God was the only one that could appease man to the Father. The power of his shed blood. There's the peace that man could have with God. And Paul, in a prison cell, in Philippians 4, had a peace that passeth all understanding through God and Jesus Christ. How can you have peace in prison? I've never been in prison as a subject. I've been there to talk to individuals. I've never seen a happy individual in a prison. Not one crying out for mercy, crying out for whatever it is they may be. But here's a peace. And then if you will please, in that frame, look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. And we, we see that thread all over again. Ephesians 2 verse uh, 10, 11, and 12. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called the uncircum uncircumcision by them they're called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands 
that that time you were without Christ, being agents from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus you are sometimes far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. Who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Every Gentile town that we have a record of, during the journeys of the Apostle Paul, except Athens, Greece, he met a Jewish insurrection. The Jews didn't like the Gentiles, Gentiles didn't like the Jews. But because of the peace of the gospel, Jew and Gentile alike could have a peace among themselves. It will be a covenant of peace. God will be pacified. Your sins can be washed away in the blood of the Lamb. You can have peace with your co you can have peace with your cohorts. A peace that passes all understanding. I wanted to take one New Testament book, and I'll just give a little bit of this as time is running out. To talk about something of the life of Christ. So much is said of the life of Christ and volumes written. In the book of Mark, if you'd like to turn there, I'll list some passages quickly and before David pulls the hook on me. In the book of Mark, of the 31 parables that Jesus did, only four are mentioned. Of about 39 miracles that he did, 21 are mentioned in the book of Mark. Now why? Why is it that way? Mark 7, Mark wrote, He hath done all things well. He made both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Verse 37. There's no competition between the miracles and what he taught. Chapter 1, verse 35, he rose up a great while before day and went to solitary place and there prayed, the praying Christ. In chapter 2, they questioned him about healing. He said, they that are whole have no need of physician, but they who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners under repentance. Chapter 3, he is impartial, the impartial Christ. Chapter, uh, verse 35, Whosoever shall do the will of God the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. In chapter 4, he said, uh, he said uh, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Put fearful and faith together. Verse 40, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus Christ, a man of power. And there's a man healing uh, who had demons, a legion of them, uh, about to, uh, hundreds of them. And Jesus cast the demon out, and they read headlong into 2,000 swine who perished in the sea. And this man who was deserted by everybody else, put in chains and fetters, and lived in the tombs, and could just break them apart. He said, Lord, I want to go with you. And Jesus said, no, go home to thy friends. What friends? Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and have compassion on thee. In chapter 6, uh, notice verse uh, 50. Be of good cheer as I, be not afraid. Christ, a man of peace. Chapter 7, I think I've already given verse 37. Chapter 8, verse uh, 36 and 37. What shall a man profit? He gained the whole world and lose his own soul. What shall, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? A man with good values, proper values. Chapter 9, as a king. Some of you standing here shall not taste of death until you see, you've seen the kingdom come with power. And by the way, some of our aforementioned brethren today are teaching that the kingdom and the church are not the same. Mark and Matthew and Luke didn't know that evidently. Chapter 10, he was a matter, he was a one who was earnest in everything with good morals, verse 20 and 21. Uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11, making his 
triumphant entry of the city of Jerusalem on a colt. I call this the Cadillac and Volkswagen syndrome. He could have had a prancing mare, but chose a colt, the Volkswagen, instead of the Cadillac. Chapter 12, verse 24, man of conviction. You do, not therefore, you, you do not therefore err because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. Chapter, I'll skip. Chapter 15. Here he is in, he is in, well, he's about to be in prison. I call that the hindered Christ. His work is stopped. He knew what he had to do. But today, he's hindered by compromise, by ignorance, by indifference, by neglect, by stinginess. I get that out of 15 and verse 1 of Mark. A lover of souls, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the value of soul. But he died for it. He made it. Man undercut that. The devil tried to destroy it. In Matthew 4, Jesus overcame Satan. Will not whip him out the way Jesus did. We can say no. Let us put on the Lord. Thank you.